everybody to the first board meeting of the fall. I'm pretty, and it is fall legitimately. I, um, I think it's pretty exciting that we are meeting in person um, for new trustees, student trustees. This is not normally how our board had been set up, but in order to meet our, you know, the, the mandate that the, the um, our meeting room had to be rearranged to accommodate everybody so that we all could work safely together but apart. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be calling the meeting to order for this evening and we're going to start out with our acknowledgement that we acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional land of Saugeen Ojibwe Nation which is represented by the communities of Saugeen First Nation and Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation. We also think of the Métis Nation of Ontario, whose history and people are well represented in Bruce and Gray Counties. The next part is, of course, is our reflection. And, and this happens at board meetings. Um, and um, so this is for September 22nd, 2020. Um, this is a unique and unprecedented time in Blue Water District School Board as students, staff, and families settle into the third week of school. With several new health and safety protocols in place following several months of closure, our schools and facilities are looking and operating a bit different this year. Some of the traditional back to school events and activities that we normally look forward to are not quite the same as usual. However, we know that while things are not exactly as they were, our students and staff are excited to once again be in school, interacting and engaging with their peers. There are still um, very special occasions we look forward to recognizing. September 30th is Orange Shirt Day in honor of residential school survivors. As always, I know that many of our students and staff will be wearing orange to demonstrate our board's on going commitment to reconciliation. I would like to take this time to welcome all our new and returning students, staff and families who are perceiving, who are persevering and working together to ensure a positive school year startup. This extends to those who are particip participating in our remote learning school. We thank our planning staff and those who supported them this summer for the dedication and diligence in preparing our schools and facilities for a safe reopening. Thank you also to all the staff in our schools and centrally, you have been so supportive in getting our schools up and running and keeping our system operating. For the moment of reflection, please join me in acknowledging the efforts of many individuals who continue to step up in their true spirit of collaboration to proactively address the complexities posed by the pandemic to our education system. Despite the current situation, we optimistically look forward to the year ahead and extend our very best wishes for success to all our students and staff in 2020 and 2021. Okay, thank you. So first up, and it's very exciting, is that we're gonna have a declaration of student trustees and centers, and I'd like to, um, I, I guess uh, Superintendent Lemon is gonna take over this part. <laughs> she goes really.
thank you very much. So just to let everybody know here is that I, I am getting new glasses, which means that I can, this is for seeing things up close. But as I look down the table, I will struggle with names. <laughs> because and so I know that is student trustee wall but when I look to my left I know that it's Victoria but Victoria I don't I can't actually see your last name so I just need it so that I Ernest thank you Just, just to let you know, uh, student trustee Ernest, is that I actually can't even see how it's spelled. That's okay, but it, it gives you some idea about <laughs> that. The fact is, I, you know, I don't see things in distance, which then brings me to all the wonderful new uh, student senators. So I understand that we normally have name tags for you, and we're not sure exactly how that's going to work, but. I will be struggling, and, and I'm going to say this, uh, you know, if I can't actually read your name tag and you see me peering down at you, that you might, you know, especially if you have your hand up, that you say, oh, it's, you know, it, it's say your name so that it, it, it's helpful to me. So I'd really appreciate that. I'd also really like to uh, welcome uh, Trustee Miller, who is uh, uh, attending with us virtually, and thank you so much. Um, and so I'm going to try to keep an eye on you. So if you have your hand up, then you can, of course, in, you know, comment on the, the different items of, on the agenda before us this evening. Okay, excellent. Okay. So we're going to start. Is that the agenda for the regular meeting of the board of September 22nd, 2020, be approved as printed? Can I have a mover for that, please? Trustee Thompson and second, Trustee Morgan. All in favor and opposed, and that's carried. Is, um, is there any disclosure or pecuniary interest of, of any of the agenda items before you this evening? See none. Next, um, then we're going to go. We, we're now at uh, A4A, and so we're going to go through all the different meetings, minutes of meetings that we had that we couldn't actually approve until today. So the first one is that the minutes of the regular meeting of the board of June 16, 2020, be approved as printed. I'm going to move that since I chaired that. Can I have a seconder for that? Thank you, Trustee. Atkinson. Is there any errors or omissions that you noticed while reviewing the minutes? I see none. All in favor and opposed, and that's carried. Oh, wait. Is that? Ah, yeah, you can do that. Okay, next, that the um, minutes of the special regular meeting of the Board of June. 30th, 2020, be approved as printed. I'm going to move it. Who is the second? Thank you, Trustee Lutz. Any errors or omissions or you notice? All okay, all in favor, opposed, and carried. Next one, that the minutes of the special regular meeting of the board of July 23rd, 2020 be approved as printed. I'm moving it, and can I have someone second that? Thank you, Trustee McComb. Any errors or omissions, things that need to be deleted, added? Okay, I see none. All in favor and opposed, and that's carried. Next, we have that the minutes of the special committee of the whole board meeting of July 28, 2020, be approved as printed. Trustee Thompson, because she was a chair at that meeting. And can I have a second for that? Thank you, um, Trustee Boyd John. And just 
thinking. I'm going to do that wrong. <laughs> okay. Is there any errors or omissions or deletions to those minutes? I see none. All in favor? <laughs> and opposed and carried. So I realize, Trustee Miller, that I need to also look up at you. So if you want to move something, just wave and, you know, you can speak, you know, so don't hesitate because I'm not used to, see, you know, seeing you right there. Next, that the minutes of the special regular meeting of the board of August 25th, 2020 be approved as printed. I'm moving that. And can I have a seconder? Okay, uh, Trustee Dawson, any errors, omissions, deletions? I see none. All in favor? Opposed and carried. That the, that the minutes of the Committee of the Whole Board meeting of September 8, 2020 be approved as printed. I'm moving that. Can I have a second, please? Thank you, Trustee Lutz. Oh, any errors, deletions? I see none. All in favor and opposed and carried. So for student trustees and senators, just to let you know that these are minutes of meetings that oftentimes, unless there is an error in these, we don't necessarily talk about it. Um, or, you know, so you want, you always want to check is make sure they spelt your name right. Seriously, it happens. Okay, next. Um, the next task to do with, is there any business? Now, there's a lot of minutes here. So um, if there's any business arising from any of these mi minutes is to say what minutes you're referring to if you have business arising. So is there any business arising that you would like to speak to? Okay, I see none. So then we're going to move um, to uh, the excellence in education and I'm gonna put the motion on the floor and then I'll have Superintendent Hamilton who's gonna to speak to it. That the Blue Water District School Board receive the summer school 2020 report for information. Can I have a mover? Thank you, Trustee McComb, a second. I see Trustee Miller. And welcome, Superintendent Hamilton. Thank you, Trustee Johnstone. I'm delighted uh, this evening to bring you the report from our summer school. Um, 2020. I want to re begin by um, thanking um, now Superintendent uh, Penner Lipset, uh, who at the time when we were planning summer school was learning services administrator for student success. And so a lot of the work uh, behind the scenes in getting ready for summer school was uh, brought to, uh, was brought about because of, of her efforts. I also want to recognize uh, Kathy Archer, who has been the principal for summer school for the past two years, two summers, and has done an excellent job, and we've really appreciated the work that she did. Uh, summer school this year was delivered entirely online. Um, the students were able to register for new credit courses, credit recovery. Uh, they could accumulate some cooperative education, uh, job site experience, or they could participate in the non-credit elementary grades seven and eight uh, mathematics and literacy booster camps. The secondary summer school students for Blue Water this summer earned um, 328 credits. So 23 of those credits were uh, in the credit recovery program, 255 were um, new credits or reach ahead credits, and 31 were cooperative education. And then finally, um, nine credits were earned uh, through the uh, upgrade program. 116, and this was, a, this was quite an increase over previous years, 116 grade seven and eight students participated in the math booster camp and the summer literacy program. Normally we would have about 30 students in those programs, so it was quite an increase and we were really pleased uh, to have those students. Um, last year, 
the Blue Water District School Board became a part of the Ontario e-learning consortium. So this is um, a, a number of the boards across Ontario who offer um, online learning, e-learning courses. And so it gives the opportunity for our students to register in courses that maybe are not full, that have empty seats and other boards. And then uh, students from other boards can register for any empty seats that we have in our e-learning courses. And so uh, in summer school this year, we had 340 students from other boards who registered in Blue Water summer school courses. So the really good thing is that that helps us to be able to provide a greater variety of courses to our students um, because of the pure economics of it. Uh, we're able to uh, fund those courses because of the students from other boards who are joining us. We also had uh, seven, um, sorry, uh, I'm just looking for the number here, 75 Blue Water students who were able to find the courses they needed then in other boards. So it was a really great thing that we added to the summer school and created some good opportunities for, for our students. So I have some um, charts here that I wanted to share with you, and these are comparative charts that kind of show how this year's summer school compared to um, other years. And these are quite small, but I'll, I'll try to, um, to uh, expand some of them as we go. So you can see there that um, the number of students in total is up. Uh, that participated in summer school. Our 2020-19 uh, and 2020 year is the third uh, column there. And uh, you can compare it then to 2018-19 and then 2017-18. And again, you can see that the number of out-of-board students, and that's because of the um, Ontario e-learning consortium, uh, was much higher this year. And again, bearing in mind that some of our students were enrolled in courses in other boards. So that's why some of our students would be uh, perhaps a little lower. We had 75 of those students. So this shows um, kind of the admissions breakdown. I'll try to get this sort of in the middle. And again, you can see how it compared to other years. Uh, in the past, in previous years, it would have been really just primarily students from, the, um, from our coterminous ward that would have enrolled in our summer school. Uh, but this year is much higher with the, uh, with the consortium. So our school is the purple and then the um, other boards is represented by the orange. So this shows the number of students who completed the courses, and so you have to keep in mind that um, some students enrolled perhaps in more than one course, and so they maybe would have, once they get into it, um, focused on the one course, and then perhaps dropped the other by the, you know, the date that they could. So um, again, you can see, um, if you take a look at 2020 and you compare it to the, um, the, the 2018, two years ago, so the one on the left, um, that was the other year that we offered fully online. And that was our first year trying to do the fully online. So the really good news, if you look at that, is the number of students who were successful this year with the totally online. So that's really good news for us. And that's um, partly, in due, uh, partly due to the fact that we did get some additional funding from the government to support um, sort of mental health. And so we were able to hire some student success teachers to support um, our students, particularly some of our students who maybe had um, learning uh, exceptionalities. And so it was really great to have them. And I think it had a real impact on the number of students who were able to be successful. Um, this again is taking a look at the uh, success rate. Again, fairly comparable for other years, um, but uh, a, a good success rate in summer school. And this is uh, a success rate according to the provincial standard. In other words, the number of students who had over 70%. And again, it's the orange that uh, are the students who had over 70% on there. And um, so this is an interesting one. This kind of takes a look at the type of courses. And it's very small, and I apologize for that. But basically, the two lines that you kind of want to take a look at, again, are the, the purple line, which is the new credit courses. You can see that most of the students were involved in the new credit courses. And that kind of shows the sort of the, the marks that they received. And so any of the longer lines there, the last five lines, were students who would have been successful. 
um, successfully completed new credit courses. Uh, the orange line, if you take a look at last year, is the co-ops, number of students who participated in co-op. So it was a little bit lower this year, and we did limit the number of students who participated in co-op this year because of the COVID, uh, the pandemic. Um, and so there weren't as many, but certainly the students who did participate in the co-op uh, were successful. Co-op has been a big part of summer school in the past, so not having those students um, was, was something that we missed. It was different. So this shows a kind of the breakdown again of, of special education students who participated in summer school. So the purple shows the students who we didn't have data for. So many of those had been out of board students. We wouldn't have had them. Um, the orange shows the students who were uh, successful, who had an IEP. Uh, and then the, uh, the others show students who uh, were unsuccessful or who dropped their courses. So I'm just gonna jump ahead here and this one is an interesting one. If you compare again in the three years, if you look each year, the number of students who have an IEP or who have an, I, who have an IPRC who have been successful in summer school has increased. It's gradually been going up. So that's really good news for our students as well on the board. And I'll leave it at that. Um, so, um, once again, we'd like to just express our thanks to all the uh, teachers uh, who participated and supported us in summer school. We had a really, uh, we had lots of interest this year, which was nice. In, in, in past years, we've maybe struggled to find enough teachers to teach our courses, but we had really good interest this year and, um, and a very successful year in terms of the number of students who were able to um, gain credits and, and uh, move ahead there, you know, in their various pathways. So thank you, Chair Johnson. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to try to field them. So I'm um, going to take some questions. Go ahead, Trustee Dawson. Thank you, Chair Johnson. I'm very impressed with the uh, elementary numbers. Is that part of the because the schools were closed down for March or June? That parents put that opportunity to have their kids enroll? Have you heard that? I think that's probably part of it. I think the other thing is that we haven't, I don't know that we've offered the online, uh, the, um, the grade seven and eight online previously. So that was new and that might have been part of it because I mean it's a, we only offer we only have one school site and it's in Owen Sound and so it's a long drive for students to come in for that. So I think that may have been a factor as well but certainly you know the, with the pandemic and the fact that students had been out of school and maybe they were concerned that they wouldn't have picked up all the necessary learning that they needed to be successful in secondary school in the fall. Trustee Thompson. I noted that your uh, success rate seems to be in improving year over year. Do you have a sense of why that is occurring? I, mean, I think the supports that we've put in place, um, I think it was just last year that we actually, we, we changed our registration process so that all of our schools had access to IEPs. And so we were able to kind of plan a little bit ahead for that. So I think that was a factor. And Lauren, I don't know if you have any other sort of comments on that. Good evening, hi everybody. Uh, I was just thinking about the also the teacher. Um, thank you. I didn't want to touch it. The teacher. <laughs> well, Paul, you know, Paul touched it, so I thought I shouldn't be touching. The teacher training that we've done over the past couple years. So we have spent some a lot of time on professional development for our summer school teachers, and we did start that a couple years ago. But we've refined it and we've learned from it and. We've um, learned also from some of their questions and some of their comments what they need some help and support with, particularly around the technology to make the courses more engaging, more interesting, and that they can help support the students with the technology um, so the students can be successful in the course. So I think that might be another factor. Any other questions? Go ahead, Trustee Dawson, then I'm gonna Call in the student trustee. Thank you again for allowing me to ask another question. The uh, concern is uh, a large number of people from other districts do the consortium, and that's not the same as the bank. How does that compare with other? Sorry about that. Um, concerning the, the e-learning consortium and the number of people that we had from out of district 
Uh, how does that compare to other boards? Because they assume that uh, there'd be a variety of courses offered across the province and people would have an opportunity to chair. I think my the bottom question is, why did those people choose us rather than maybe mm -hmm. another? I mean, I, I'll give a little bit of information, and then Lauren can add some as well. This is our first year in the consortium. It's been going for a while, and there are a lot of students who would have chosen um, around the province courses that were available. So I don't know that you know we had a disproportionate number of students enrolled in our board. It was new to us, and so we had lots of them. It was really good. Uh, the really good thing about the consortium is that any students who enroll in our board, um, we get funded for it. Yeah, but for students that, our students that enroll in other boards, they get funded for it as well. So it really helps to um, make it economically viable for us, so it's a really good thing for it. Uh, the other piece that related to it is, um, with the consortium, it, it's also available to students during the year. So we have students now who are able to um, sign up for courses, again, that they wouldn't maybe be able to get in their local school uh, that are being offered through e-learning in other boards. And similarly, we can fill up some of our empty spaces uh, for e-learning courses and make them, again, more viable within our own board. I don't, do you have anything to add to that, Lauren? Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like a win-win. It is. Yeah, it's been a great piece. Thank you. Thank you. So is there any other questions from trustees or comments? I see none, but I'm just really curious because we do have students in here today. And I would be very curious if, for example, you, you knew of your, some of your classmates who maybe took courses online or, you know, or if you, you yourself or did you take a course through our board or even, you know, at an extent, you know, at another board and were there differences or, you know, so, I mean, if I'm just really interested and I'm also interested what maybe the senators say if they share choose to share. So, great. <laughs> Um, I've actually taken two summer school courses. I took one in grade 11, and then I took one um, this past summer. Um, I actually didn't complete the one that I took this last summer because of my work schedule. It was very, very busy, so I didn't have time for it. But um, I was in, I believe, the Waterloo board um, where I took biology. And I did find that there was... Um, not a lot of difference between being in our board and outside of the board. I find that they were both good. I just didn't have time to complete it, but yeah. And just because I, I'm not familiar with how it, you know, it all necessarily operates, did you have any engagement with the other students in your class that were taking the same course? Um, so, aside from like the the teacher would give us discussion questions, and and if you chose to, you could interact with the other students that were taking it. But other than that, there wasn't really any reason to. And how about student censures? If anybody, I know that normally we don't, but I I, I think that you know this is a a dis we're talking about student learning online from this summer, and I'm just wondering if anybody had anything they wanted to share with our you know with with trustees and you know in terms of this program. No. You guys, you really are going to get over your shyness. Anyway, well, so thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to put the motion back on the floor, and thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Hamilton. That the Blue Water District School, uh, District School Board received the Summer School 2020 report for information. It was moved by Trustee McComb and seconded by, and I actually just put trustee down there. Who was the seconder for that motion? Miller. Miller. Right. <laughs> I can't believe that. Trustee Miller. All in favor? and opposed and carried. I normally, just to let you know, Trustee Miller, just because we have more distance between us, 
that normally in the pre-pandemic times that um, the director would write all this stuff down for me, so I realize I'm being quite dyslexic when I'm doing it myself. Okay. So now we're moving on to, we don't have any delegations. Um, so next up, it is um, that the Blue Water District School Board received the Special Committee of the Whole Board meeting Tuesday, July 28th, 2020, report for information. It's going to be moved by Trustee Thompson, and I need somebody to second, so Trustee Morgan. And uh, Trustee Thompson, would you like to speak to that? Uh, it feels like a long time ago, July uh, 28th. Um, we just had the one item on our agenda that night, and that was to look at our school reopening plan. But we did have a long meeting. It went on for two and a half hours of uh, conversation and questions and trying to understand what that would look like. And I'm very aware that we've had to pivot some uh, since that time. And uh, it's a very fluid situation and a lot of reacting to try and uh, meet the needs of all of our students, but that was uh, the content of that meeting. Excellent. Is there any questions or comments concerning that meeting? I mean, you're right, July 28th, because we had so many meetings this summer. Normally, we don't, but we did. Okay, I see none. So and put the motion back on the floor that the Blue Water District School Board receive the Special Committee of the Whole Board meeting Tuesday, July 28, 2020, report for information. It was moved by Trustee Thompson, seconded by Trustee Morgan. All in favor and opposed, if any, and that is carried. Um, next, we I'm actually, it's the recommendations from the Committee of the Whole Board, September 8th. There are, uh, there are going to be two. I will put the first one on the floor that the Blue Water District School Board approved BP 6501-D, transportation as revised for system use. Can I have someone second that? Thank you very much. Trustee Atkinson. And it's on the floor. And is there any discussion concerning that? I don't see any, but just to let, you know, student, uh, Student trustees and senators know that we had lots of discussion, you know, previously at another committee, um, at the committee that it's coming forward to the board as it f changes from a recommendation to a motion. And unless it generally is not something like this is not contentious, so everybody's good with it. Okay, so I'm going to call the question. All in favor and opposed, and that's carried. So the next. Uh, motion from the same um, committee of the regular okay i'm just i just lost my mind committee of the whole board that the blue water district school board approved bp 6950-d prior learning assessment and recognition player as revised for system use can i have someone who seconds that i see uh trustee boy john oh. Is there any um, questions or comments concerning that? I see none. All in favor then and opposed, and that's also carried. Thank you. Next. It's the business committee. So that the Blue Water District School Board received the report of the business committee of the whole board meeting held on September 8th, 2020 for information. Can I have a mover? Thank you. And can I have someone second that? Trustee Lutz and um, Trustee Dawson is the chair of that committee and you'd like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Chair Johnstone. Uh, on uh, September 8th, the uh, Business Committee of the Whole met, and we had uh, a number of items on the agenda. We had three, four information items for you. Uh, we discussed the 2021 school reopening and COVID-19 response. The committee received a report outlining the financial details of the opening, 
of reopening schools and the costs associated with remote, remote learning. There was a fairly lengthy positive discussion of these items. Uh, the plan seemed to be well thought out, but expensive. Item number two was a school, 2020 school renewal projects update. And we received a photographic presentation of the various capital projects that were undertaken across the district during the summer. Uh, Georgian Bay Community School update, we received a report with a photographic presentation of the status of the new Georgian Bay Community School. The building is progressing well and it's actually starting to look like a real school. So that's exciting. If you have a chance to drive by, uh, take a look. It really is a, a, an exciting project that's ongoing. Item number four, Beavercrest Community School update. The committee received an update on the school project. Since the meeting, the Committee of Adjustments for the Municipality of Great Highlands has approved the severance of some land to be added to the Beavercrest site, and it is approaching the end of the 20-day consultation response period. So there's some good news there. Thank you, Chair Johnson. That's my report. Thank you very much. So is there any questions or comments from trustees from around the table? table concerning um, the report from Trustee Dawson. Okay, I see none. I'm going to put the motion back on the floor that the Blue Water District School Board receive the report of the Business Committee of the whole board meeting held on September 8, 2020 for information. It was moved by Trustee Dawson, seconded by Trustee Lutz. All in favor? And opposed? And that's also carried. Okay. There it is. Yep, B2, report. Yep, yep, report from the committee of the whole board. There is no report. <laughs> so I, I so, um, and I'm just look, looking at that. So B2, just this for the, the student trustees and senators, is that normally um, the vice chair always um, chairs the uh, committee of the whole board in camera, but we actually d don't have a report from that. So it, there's nothing to report this evening. So next, um, is there any notices of motion coming before the trustees this evening that you'd like to submit? Okay, I see none. And now we're moving down to the B section. So um, we're going to do, here it is, that the Blue Water District School Board appoint Liz Tom. Thomas as a member of the Special Education Advisory Committee for the remainder of the 2019-2022 term as nominated by Keystone Child, Youth and Family Services. Can I have a mover? Trustee Atkinson and seconder, Trustee McComb. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Superintendent Lemon. Nope. Uh, trustees are aware that on occasion we have vacancies on a committee such as SEAC where we have a community member appointment. Um, our representative from Keystone, Michelle Scobie, uh, actually has retired and moved to Ottawa. And so that has created the vacancy uh, for us. So Keystone is uh, recommending the appointment of Liz Thomas to replace Michelle. Thank you very much. Is there any questions or comments concerning this appointment? I see none. That, so I'll put the motion back on that the Blue Water District School Board appoint Liz Thomas as a member of the Special Education Advisory Committee for the remainder of the 2019-2022 term as nominated by Keystone Child Youth and Family Services. It was moved by Trustee Atkinson, seconded by Trustee McComb. All in favor? and opposed and carried in happy retirement to the person. Okay. Okay, so we're now at student senate reports and I'd like to very much welcome um, 
student trustee Wall to provide a report. Uh, hi, thank you very much, and have some patience with me because this is all a little new, I think, uh, for, well, for myself. Um, I have been so impressed with the work that the, this Senate has done, and I think I can speak for Vicky on that too. Um, it's early days yet, and everything's a little strange right now, but we've, we've done some good work. Um, so we hope to, by Friday, by the 25th, have a survey written and sent out to as many students as we can get access to. Um, we want to collect information on how, just how people are doing with everything new. Um, and then using that, we can work forward. Um, but we really want to focus on two-way communication with the general student body. Um, another goal that we've been working towards and have been talking about since day one is during these, well, it's, it's a pandemic. Nobody's really sure how tomorrow's gonna be. And we wanna make sure that the students can turn to the senators and that they know they're being heard. Um, so to that end, uh, Taylor Legg has been doing some great work um, making our social media presence known to the world and accessible. Um, she's mentioned she answered 20 questions um, by students just looking for information. And I was really impressed by that. And that survey too by Alexis Hollister will be distributed through uh, social media and hopefully through schools as well, if we can get that going. Um, Vicki Ernest has also been doing some great work uh, working towards a partnership between the Senate and Grey Bruce Public Health. Um, the details of that are currently in flux but I am really looking forward to doing that because student health is, is, is just a good thing. I don't think there is anybody here against that. Um, we have been continuing the work done for us by the prior Senate. They've left us, well, it's, it's a big, some big shoes to fill and we hope to do that and make some shoes of our own, ideally. Um, it's early days yet. Um, but we want to push for student governance, uh, student councils. I think, and I can speak for the Senate on this, this is important, um, especially during right now. Um, nobody's sure what they'll be doing, but they need to be there so that the students feel heard because, well, it's, it's something that needs to happen. So we, uh, each of the, sen uh, the senators has committed to pushing for student governments uh, in, their, in their school. And we probably have more, but that's all I've got for you right now. And I look forward to, to working with everybody in this room and having more things to say next time. That's excellent. You did really a good job. So trustees, do you have any questions concerning the Student Senate report? Go ahead, Trustee Thompson. I really enjoyed your report and your enthusiasm and um, the initiatives that you're taking to get uh, connected with everyone. I just wondered how, um, I appreciate how you're going to connect with the students within the on the ground schools. Have you um, got an idea how you will connect with our virtual schools and the students that are attending there so they're also heard? Yes, we have, <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, we have thought about that. Uh, Alexis, or was it Taylor? The senators in charge of that want to get in touch with the principal of the online school um, and use them to distribute it to their students. Because this is, I think their voices need to be heard more than anyone's. Uh, so that's how we're planning to do that. Oh, it's a really good Good question. Thank you very much for asking that, Trustee Thompson. Is there any other questions or comments from other trustees? I see none. Thank. Oh, 
Jennifer, Jennifer, sorry. Go ahead, uh, go right ahead, Trustee Miller. Can I ask for uh, clarification about what you mean by that? Um, yes, so the senators who have spearheaded this um, want to get in touch with the principal of the online school um, and distribute it through that. Um, there's not a lot more I can say right now because we're still at the beginning, but that, that's the plan. Thank you. Good question. Is there any further questions or comments? Okay, I see none, but I want to thank you very much, uh, student trustee Wall. And just to let you know that at some point in the very, very near future, um, it, it's that what I, what I do, normally the chair and the vice chair come and uh, attend a, a meeting of, of your group. And that we, you know, so if you have any questions all around the organization, but just, uh, um, you know, how it operates, you know, a, a board, um, or just how we can work better, closer together for, of course, in the best interests of students in the school board. So I look forward to doing that, and we can talk to Superintendent Lemon when that can possibly happen. And sooner is better than later. Next, that the Blue Water District School Board received the commit, commitment to a mentally healthy return to school report for information. Can I have a mover for that, please? Uh, thank you, Trustee Lutz. Can I have a second? Trustee um, <laughs> Morgan, I know. It was there, it was there, it, it was there, friend. And I would like to bring forward Trustee Lemon. And I just want to say, I noticed today, Trustee Lemon, that when we were going over the agenda for tonight's meeting, that you were, they were really working you a lot because you keep on popping up as the presenter. So thank you. It's something to do with being the pandemic lead. <laughs> thank you, Chair Johnstone. Um, you, you will recall over the last number of meetings uh, when we've talked about the return to school planning and then our actual return that the mental health of our staff and students was a priority for all of us. Uh, one of the uh, pieces that we also chatted about was the school mental health in Ontario. So this is important enough to bring to you in more detail this evening, and I'm very pleased to introduce Melissa McEwen, who is our new Learning Services Administrator in Student Support. Melissa comes to us um, from some significant special education experience. She was actually uh, working at the board level for a number of years before we placed her back in a school as a vice principal in JD, as I recall, and then did I, Chesley JD, and then principal at Sogging District. So and we've now snatched her back into the fold. And she's a great asset to us. I, I actually couldn't have survived without her this fall thus far, so I appreciate all the work she does. And she's going to speak to you now about School Mental Health Ontario and also um, how the trustees uh, can fit into that. So, Melissa. It's never a good sign when you have the bleep before you even begin. Thank you uh, for allowing me some time on your agenda this evening, uh, Chair Johnstone, trustees, student trustees, and student senators. Uh, I'm here to speak to you about our commitment to a ment mentally healthy return to school. 
Blue Water District School Board demonstrates a very strong commitment to enhance and protect student mental health. As we return to school this fall, uh, more so than ever, this needs to be a priority for us. We have to acknowledge and validate that students will be experiencing a range of emotions as they return to school this fall. And there will be challenges that are related to the return, specifically in the area of mental health that we need to be addressing. Tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about School Mental Health Ontario. If I can get the slideshow to work. School Mental Health Ontario uh, is a collaborative effort that has contributors from various aspects of the mental health field. It is a resource for um, a variety of stakeholders. Specifically, you can access resources for school and system leaders, educators, students, parents and families, school mental health professionals, and other school roles. It is a vital tool in our toolkit. It contains a number of resources that are essential, and the resources it contains are evidence-based, and the information is relevant to what we're experiencing right now. And when we look at School Mental Health Ontario, there is an emphasis on schools and classrooms and building schools and classrooms that are safe, both physically and emotionally for our students, where students feel welcome, where they understand that they can be heard, that they feel comfortable and confident. There's assets and information that look at building skill for self-care, managing stress, nurturing relationships, enhancing a sense of belonging and strength. And there's lots of information for caring adults and helping to support them in noticing when they have students who may be struggling and how to provide knowledgeable and responsive support to those students. School Mental Health looks at encouraging um, individuals to seek help when they need it and there is guidance and information available on the website about where to go for those supports. It's all about quick access to the right level of service in all of our schools and in addition within our communities. All of the resources are built around a framework that looks at having um, a leadership role right from the very top with the director, um, right to classroom staff, up to and including families and students. There's a lot of information there, a lot of resources, a lot of hands-on, very specific information that can be used to support students um, as they travel through and endure the return to school around um, accessing supports to, to help with understanding the COVID pandemic and accessing supports regarding mental health. So I want to share with you a few of the resources that are available. Um, it is a very easy website to navigate and it allows people to very specifically target what they are looking for. Um, one of the resources that I wanted to share this evening was designed for staff. It's called The First 10 Days and Beyond and it is an example of um, a resource that we've shared with our entire um, school district to allow them to have information about what can be done in the classroom over the first 10 days and beyond. Not sure, Jamie, if the link is going to work in how you set things up there. It's coming up, but it's just not showing on the screen there. Tech support, please. I'll maybe just talk about that. Um, 
So in the document, the first 10 days, it really looks at giving uh, teachers and other school-based staff very specific information about how to talk about the return to school. And it provides supports and information that can be shared directly. And it gives lesson plans, resources, information, and it provides questions that you can ask your class and students um, about their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. It takes a team. Thank you for your patience. Um, other resources I wanted to share are related to resources that are available for parents and guardians. There is some information on our board website that has been linked to School Mental Health Ontario, specific to helping uh, families um, around supporting them with information regarding the return to school and understanding and noticing if they have concerns about mental health for their child and providing them with strategies and information. Again, it's about that quick access to supports and services if they're required. Students as well, um, you may wish to look at School Mental Health Ontario. There are resources specific to students and they've de been developed um, by students in collaboration with mental health supports. Um, a couple of documents that are specific to students, one is called Self Care 101 and another is called Reaching Out. And it provides great information and resources for students about where they can go to access help and what they can do to uh, support their own mental health. There are some key messages for trustees I want to leave you with this evening. Um, we need to really focus as a board on a ha developing a place and renewing focus on issues related to mental health. We have to look at um, supporting equity within our schools and supporting our students as they return to school this fall. We want to be ready to learn for all students and we have to develop that strong sense of safety and belonging and well-being while at school. There is continuing assistance for students to prepare for their world and deal more effectively with the inequities of life. We have to focus on students returning to a school in the safest way possible. We have to look at all members of Blue Water District School Board understanding the significance of their work in promoting a mentally healthy system. And we have to look at all members of Blue Water District School Board um, developing relationships that are inherent in the structures and processes of a mentally healthy system. So the key messages I leave you with look at understanding that mental health and well-being is a priority in our board. We need to lead with compassion and empathy, that schools are an excellent place to promote and protect student mental health, and we have strong mental health foundations to build on, and ultimately we have to work together. As a result, uh, one of the first three PD days that we had this fall, all staff in Blue Water participated in mental health professional development. Um, we had our mental health lead, Reen Langen, use information from school mental health to develop a one hour uh, power, talking PowerPoint that um, exposed everyone to understanding what resources are available with school mental health, as well as developing common language around mental health and providing resources that can be used in the classroom. So I thank you for providing me with this opportunity this evening and I am open for questions. Thank you, thank you very much. That was a great report. And Trustee Dawson, go right ahead. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Uh, I too would like to thank you for your report. I'm wondering if we could have this report, the PowerPoint for the trustees, so that we can get those key messages in front of us. And also, I wonder if we could have the uh, summer school report for the, the PowerPoint. Thanks. We already got them in our mailbox, Jim. It's just so efficient. It's just fab over there. Um, thank you very much. Is there any other questions and, or comments? Go ahead, Trustee Lutz. I am capable of turning on a microphone. 
Do I just hold it? What do I do? Oh, I am capable of turning on a microphone. Thank you. I was just wondering, we have a lot of great local um, resources that students and educators can tap into. And I was just wondering, these are great general ones. And I was just wondering if the, some of the local resources and, um, and organizations, would, there would also be an effort to make sure students and staff in our schools and families were aware of them as well. Thank you. It's a great question on the board website underneath our mental health link. We have updated and provided our contacts that are local, uh, specifically um, Keystone Child Youth uh, and Family Services. We have um, CAMH there as well, as well as other local resources. And we continue to ensure that we are promoting um, other online and virtual options for families as well, looking at um, the helpline as well as West for Youth. Any other questions or comments? Trustee Thompson. Um, a comment uh, for here and for the board in general. I've noticed that we seem to be doing more um, the talking PowerPoint, the use of YouTube. Um, I think it's, it's really terrific that that information gets recorded and people can access it at the time that makes sense for them uh, to, to watch it. Um, and so I've just uh, uh, a compliment to the board that that seems to be more and more utilized. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, uh, student trustee Wall. Um, so I've got a, a question about uh, student mental health, which is, there sounds like there are some fantastic resources for both staff and students, but uh, my question is, what's the point of contact for a student who's having a, a rough go of things? Who, who do they talk to um, in, their, in their local environment? I think that uh, with the training we provided our staff, um, trustee, student trustee wall, um, we've directed students to reach out to any caring adult in a school, um, and that caring adult will be able to direct the child or the family or both to the appropriate resource, depending on their local community and what resources are available. Um, there is a, an ability for us to respond um, to the questions and queries that come up. We've promoted that not every staff member is going to be a mental health expert, but every staff member can be a caring and compassionate uh, participant in supporting and facilitating that contact for someone else. In particular, if we are looking at our secondary schools, we do have our student success teachers as well as our guidance counselors that are available um, and can uh, facilitate that connection as well as our guidance staff that are in grade seven and eight as well, um, but there is someone in every school that can be approached, uh, including the administrators that are available. Um, they are highly trained in being able to respond to any questions and queries that come up. Thank you, and is there any further questions or comments? I see none, thank you. Thank you very much, that was a, a great uh, pre presentation. Just a kind of a, a, you know, a general overview for everybody. I really appreciated um, student trustee Wall's question because I think that that is, and I think that if there was anything that went out to the school commu you know, communities uh, is really maybe a point of contact or, you know, like just so that they're not kind of you know, you know, because sometimes you just don't want to ask. So if it's, if it's a, you know, kind of an information is readily available um, in different ways of, you know, getting that information across, then I think that would be really helpful to our student population and also by extension, um, their families. So thank you, thank you very much. I'm gonna put the motion back on the floor that the Blue Water District School Board receive the commitment to a mentally health, healthy return to school report for information. It was moved by Trustee Lutz and seconded by Trustee Morgan. All in favor and opposed and of course carried. Next up again. <laughs>
is that the Blue Water District School Board received the return to school update report for information. Can I have a mover for that? Trustee Thompson is second. I saw Trustee, I'm going to go Trustee McComb. And welcome again, Superintendent Lemon. Here, I didn't write it in. If I can just uh, say that uh, Melissa modeled um, for everyone something that we've all had to do over the last few months, and her challenge was the technology, and she was able to pivot. <laughs> so. Uh, the other thing I would like to mention, which um, the Student Senate uh, may be continuing to work upon, I don't know if you recall that Lucas Shigano, student trustee last year, was working as a, a member of the Keystone Board to set up mental health boards in every school that would have some of the contact information that trustee, student trustee Wall was speaking about, not necessarily the caring adult in the school, but perhaps the caring adult in the community. So I'm sure that that's something that they will be continuing to work on because that work is not yet completed. Um, so we are going to walk you through um, an update of uh, the return to school, uh, where we're currently at, and I'm going to ask Superintendent um, Cummings to come first, but as he makes the long walk um, <laughs> around the tables, um, I spent my day having virtual meetings with the principals in Area 1, uh, and I just wanted to share a few of the things that they shared with me today. They say that students, for the most part, are quite happy. Um, they have been incredibly resilient, and they are mastering the routines like old pros, that for many students that struggle with transitions, the, the structure has been very helpful for them in terms of entry and movement in the hall and into the classroom and the routines for the hand washing and the sanitizing and the exit for recess. Um, they're finding that behavior thus far is reduced. I should probably touch wood when I say that. Um, and that they um, are finding that the zones in the schoolyard um, and the staggered recess lunch model is making a, a significant difference, particularly in elementary, um, because they have decided, the students have decided, we're a team as a class, we have to stick together, and we better play nice. Um, and so there, I, I thought that was, and I heard that consistently. I also heard consistently that there are struggles. Um, certainly uh, finding staff continues to be a challenge, and you've heard that before, both um, for teachers and educational assistants and custodial replacements. It's, it's a challenge to find the staff out there. And if you were listening to CBC this morning, you will have heard that TDSB was starting their remote school this morning, but they were short 500 teachers. So um, that, that, that's the, 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 the mammoth shortfall that they have. Ours is not quite as big, but we're struggling with that as well. Um, and they, the principals say their staffs are stepping up to the plate um, and they're doing everything that they need to do, but they're tired. They're all tired. And I will say that the administrators are doing phenomenal amounts of supervision on a daily basis. Um, in order to ensure that students are safe and well in bus lines and on the yard. So that, that, that also is exhausting for them. Um, I will come back to a couple of other things, but Rob is here. Thanks, Cynthia. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I will start a business services update, uh, return to school with our enrollment numbers. These are really preliminary because if you recall the business services uh, committee, the whole meeting in early October actually present preliminary numbers. So these are pre preliminary numbers at this point in time. So, so take them with a grain of salt. We're still working this stuff out. As you heard, there's lots of moving pieces giving everything that's going on. So our numbers are holding very close to projection. So we believe we're probably in the 100 range, close to projection, so that's pretty good given, given the year. Uh, given the circumstances around the year, we do see a decrease in our JK enrollment, uh, but we have seen an increase in our 7 and 8s this year. Um, just some ballpark numbers. Right now we're looking at about 11% in remote learning, and that's consistent across elementary and secondary. And um, 
I don't have good secondary numbers yet, so I'm not even going to pretend uh, that they are pre-preliminary, but you will get that report uh, on October 6th. Uh, similarly, with our finance, uh, financial services, uh, we have a very comprehensive report coming to you at Business Committee. I don't want to uh, blow the whole show here, so uh, certainly uh, we will be looking at our COVID funding, uh, our B memos, our SB memos, the funding that was available, and how we're applying that funding uh, to some spending. That being said, I will touch on a little bit as I go through this. Our ICT department continues to support our remote learning uh, groups along with the other 40-some uh, uh, schools uh, in terms of their preparation for the year and moving forward. Uh, certainly in our plant services, there's lots of discussion around HVAC and HVAC spending. If you recall, we did receive over $500,000 for specific to HVAC. And uh, certainly we're going to be using some of those funds for upgraded filters, uh, specifically additional quantities to facilitate an increased frequency of replacement. Uh, so we're looking at approximately $35,000 to $40,000 for that. I also have the plan for an HVAC technician, uh, along with a control specialist, to come in and confirm that our uh, operations of all of our rooftop units uh, are operating efficiently and to the optimum level uh, expected. <clears throat> We're also looking into a few portable HEPA filtration units for use in isolation rooms um, within some of the schools. Again, we're looking at about 40,000 for that. And of course, as we've mentioned a couple times now, our custodial spending uh, is going up as we uh, compensated for our absentee uh, custodial use from 60% to 100%. Uh, exactly what Cynthia said is the same problem we are having with custodial. It is hard to find replacement custodians, especially when that demand for replacement custodians goes up when you increase your service level from 60% to 100%. So uh, there are some days when we are scrambling. There's no question about that. And thank you for everybody who's actually being very patient and filling in for other people along the way to make things work. Uh, then we have our transportation group. So we uh, talked in August that we started the year with nine out of our 325 routes uh, without drivers. So we just don't have those drivers available. All the spare drivers we did have have become full-time drivers, uh, essentially, and we're still short, short nine. Uh, on any given day, there's probably 12, between 12 and 16 routes that are canceled as drivers have booked off for sickness and other needs. So where we are right now is our route planners have been able to consolidate eight of those vacant routes uh, onto other routes. And uh, students from these eight routes will be advised of the new transportation this week, actually yesterday, today, and uh, probably tomorrow for transportation going forward. Um, our operators, our bus operators, are reporting that their new applicants are being hired, trained and tested. Uh, as I've said before, this takes a little bit of time. Also, it's being outpaced by the number of drivers who are leaving the system, so we can't hire fast enough uh, that for, to replace the ones that are leaving. Uh, that being said, you cannot do nothing. So we are uh, putting our best foot forward and supporting our operators in terms of doing that. If you recall, we were funded some 800 and some thousand dollars for our operators for recruitment or retention. Uh, we have a plan in place that we have discussed with our bus operators and verbally accepted uh, to apply some, that funding to them, also to apply the bus uh, cleaning funding uh, to them. So. Uh, that money spent, essentially. Uh, we do know that ridership is down, uh, and I don't think anybody in the room uh, didn't see that coming, but certainly ridership is down. I don't have exact counts. Uh, we did a count on September 15th and 16th, and we're collecting and collating the data uh, for, uh, for a better report going forward. <clears throat> uh, as you know, some of the challenges that we have, given the contact tracing concerns, our buses don't do double runs anymore. So previously we had the opportunity where a bus would do a run, uh, specifically in urban centers. So in Owen Sound, they'd do a run, come in, drop them off, and go back out and do a quick B run, where it would be a smaller group of people on the bus, uh, but they would be able to support a larger number of students and the school uh, on one bus. Uh, we can't do that anymore because of the contact tracing issues. Um, so what we are trying to do is trying to find ways around that. Uh, ridership is down. Once we have a better idea on how much ridership is down, there may be a way to schedule buses and transportation for more students. Um, but again, on any given day, we do not know who's going to be on a bus. 
Uh, supplies and PPE, so MGCS, MGCS uh, for everybody who may not know is the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services. Uh, our supplies order goes into them monthly and uh, the first order had uh, a few logistics with it, uh, province-wide, and uh, the August shipment for September uh, did come in. We do have PPE and, and cleaning supplies, um, but it wasn't as smooth as it could be. So there are certainly, uh, certainly some things that we've had to overcome. We do have an emergency supply process by which our schools are able to contact the Rockford uh, facility uh, and uh, put their name in for supply, sorry, for emergency supplies if needed, and we're trying to keep that topped up. As you can imagine, the first order, like any order, when you're trying to uh, predict and forecast demand, uh, can have a few ups and downs to it as you go forward. So our October order is already in. We're expecting that to arrive prior to September 29th. Uh, there'll be similar quantities to the September order, uh, but we do believe it being fully fulfilled uh, when it comes in. And we'll main make sure that we maintain our emergency supply as well uh, as we go forward with that. Uh, the PPE orders go directly to the schools. Disinfected product goes to Rockford and it gets trucked out uh, from there. Uh, Chair Johnston, that's uh, the update I have from Business Services for the return to school. Thank you very much. Is there any questions concerning um, the report? Okay, so Trustee Lutz and then Trustee Thompson. Go ahead, Trustee Lutz. Thank you. Um, I just had a co comment based on what we heard from Superintendent Lemon that uh, my my daughter is reporting much of what you said about um, recess being a wonderful uh, time with the students together from their classes and also um, just that things really are going smoothly in the schools and also for transportation to touch on uh, Superintendent Cummings, I know uh, at least our bus run has been going very well. We are seeing lots of smiling, well, smiling eyes on uh, masked faces. And it is uh, going very, very, very well. So a huge thank you to everyone and all the emergency supply teachers who I have already heard are in the schools as well. And things are going very, very, very well. So hearing that from lots of sides. So thank you all for all your hard work. And thank you, and Trustee Thompson. Just curious, with the consolidation of some of the bus routes to um, compensate for the lack of drivers, has that increased some of our routes substantially for length of time for students? Uh, through the chair, I think normally you would expect something like that, but because of the ridership levels right now, we're not seeing that. So uh, uh, with the change in routes becomes a new route, and the timeline on that route is is accounted for and reconciled as we go forward. And uh, and just to, to touch on uh, Trustee Lutz's comment, you know, our route planners have done an amazing job. I was not expecting them to be able to compensate for the lost drivers until October. So the fact that they're actually able to put, uh, put students on the buses in this short order, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment for them. And, uh, and all of the business services people are working. Um, I don't want to say they're working hard, but they are working damn hard <laughs> in terms of making all this work. So, uh, so certainly appreciated. Uh, uh, I mean, we're happy to see our students get what they need to get in order to get to school. So it's well worth it. Is there any other questions for Superintendent Cummings? Okay, hey, I don't see any. Thank you. And I think we have some others up. Yes, thank you, Chair Johnstone. Uh, Superintendent Hamilton and Superintendent Cullohan are going to tag team on remote schools. Thank you, Superintendent Lemon. Um, Chair Johnson, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to um, just let you know that we currently have, as of 4 o'clock today, uh, 1,883 students enrolled in remote learning school. So that is our largest school by far in the district. 
uh, that school, that students from K uh, through to 12, we have it divided into elementary and secondary. So we have 1,358 students in elementary and 525 students in secondary. We were able to do a soft launch on September 16th. We had hoped to do it on the 12th. We had some difficulties with technology and uh, getting staff in place, and so we had to delay it for a few days. But I am very pleased that we were able to get it started, and uh, teachers started making contact with students on the 16th. So within, if you think about it, within three um, calendar weeks, uh, we have completely created um, the largest school in uh, Blue Water. So that's, if you think about what was involved with that, um, so we had to hire, um, we've had to hire staff for that many students, a large number of staff, and, and find them, a lot of advertising, a lot of interviewing, um, setting up the schedule for uh, 525 uh, secondary students, separate sort of individual courses, and try to get those courses established for them. And um, it has been uh, a very large job. I, where it was three calendar weeks, I'm guessing it would be at least at six, uh, six work weeks because a lot of people uh, have put in a lot of extra time to make this possible and to make it happen. So we would really uh, like to acknowledge and thank our staff for the, uh, their commitment uh, to, to getting this going. So on the 16th, teachers were asked to make contact with the students on their roster. And uh, our first question to families were whether or not they preferred to do the synchronous learning, where they're going to be meeting with us face to face online, or where they preferred to do asynchronous. And so we're collecting that data at this point. And teachers are currently providing asynchronous work, so work that students can do um, connected to their course, but it's not necessarily meeting with them face to face at this point. Um, the soft start has allowed us to gather that information about the synchronous and asynchronous so that we can really serve each family according to their preference and, uh, and not just start with that, uh, the assumption that it was all going to be synchronous. Uh, in terms of staffing, we currently, we reassigned, as I think I mentioned last week, um, two of our system principals, um, Carla Whiteside and Keith Lefebvre, and they have been co-principaling and doing a, just a, a huge amount of work. Uh, Keith, of course, is our technology uh, principal in the board, and so he brings that expertise to the role, and uh, so they've been doing a lot of um, setting up and interviewing. Um, we are in the process of hiring an office manager, an office professional to support. Um, up until now, we have been using um, some of our office professionals from the uh, board office, so we've had two from Learning Services and then the two from Plant that have been supporting us. Um, we have... 48 uh, sections of secondary uh, that we're offering, 48 classes that we're offering. And um, so far, we've been able to uh, hire for 39 of those sections. Uh, to fill in for the missing ones, we've, had, we've been reassigning uh, system teachers. So many of our teachers who would normally be doing supporting professional development within the system are now uh, teaching online courses either at elementary or at the secondary level. I think Keith Lefebvre is currently teaching four courses on top of being the principal. So uh, he's a, a very busy man. At the elementary level, um, we need approximately 70 full-time equivalent teachers. We've been able to hire at the time of writing this report um, 45. So again, we've been filling in as much as we can. These are occasional teachers that we've hired. The challenge with that, of course, is that those occasional teachers uh, are now not available to support schools with the absenteeism that they have. Uh, so, um, so that's one of the reasons that we're looking, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about our plans kind of going forward. There is, uh, they are interviewing 13 teachers, I think, tomorrow. Three of those are secondary and 10 of them are elementary, so we're hoping to, again, close the gap a wee bit. So external ads have been posted in an effort to fill the gaps, and uh, new hires are being added and assigned um, as quickly as, they, as we can. Um, we have posted and reposted until we, and, and we're gradually building, so we're pleased with that. Elementary students were asked to make their decision about whether or not they were going to remain in their local school their community school, or move to the remote school today. 
and at 9 o'clock this morning was the deadline. We had originally uh, hoped that we would be able to do, uh, keep it fluid so that students would be able to move in and out you know, when they felt comfortable. Um, there were just a number of logistical issues with that. Uh, we are required to report to the ministry um, our class uh, configurations and sizes, and those need to be aligned with the uh, provincial uh, class size uh, um, recommendations or requirements, right? So, for example, in a primary class, we have uh, 20 uh, students to, to a teacher. That has to be the average across the board. Currently, with the limited number of teachers that we have in our remote school, we have some of our classes that have up to 40 students in them. Uh, so we, you know, we are obviously not meeting the requirements in terms of, of class size. So we are going to be doing, and we've begun the process, um, which we do every year, where we take a look at the enrollment in all of our schools, and we see the number of students that we have, where we have um, too many, uh, where we've had a high uh, increase in the enrollment, we will add staff and classrooms to those schools. Uh, where we've had a, a drop in enrollment, we will um, transfer uh, teachers, or reduce the number of classes and transfer teachers out of them. This year, the remote learning school is a part of that process. So students um, who, you know, schools that have um, a large uh, reduction perhaps in their enrollment, uh, because many students have moved to the remote uh, school, we will be um, moving some of those staff over to the remote learning school. Um, students have to be transitioned in the student information system by th uh, Thursday, September 24th. So they have to be physically moved over so that we can do the counts and send those counts into the ministry so that they've got that accurate record and that impacts our funding. So it's very important that we get that right. So students, um, so we are encouraging students to make that move, you know, uh, and where, um, you know, where that's an issue, uh, we are trying to make some uh, allowances and accommodation for that so that if students need to stay a little longer, um, they can. So once students have been moved to the new school, um, the school, uh, that school, for example, the remote school, has all of their information in the student information system. Um, their attendance would be taken in that. Um, so that is one of the complications uh, in terms of students staying in their home school. In terms of secondary, our focus has been on providing compulsory courses at various grade levels and pathways. So we're looking at English, math, history, geography, and we have added some elective courses uh, that would have broad appeal. Um, I was talking today with uh, Andrea Tang, who is our Learning Services Administrator for Student Success, and uh, we have only about six students at this point out of that uh, group of 500, the over 500, who we don't have assigned to courses yet. So a tremendous, tremendous effort, and everybody from adult ed and student success and all of the staff upstairs in Learning Services have been working uh, overtime to make this happen. Um, there have been a few cases where we've not been able to provide a suitable course, and for those students, we've been looking at independent learning options, and of course, the Ontario eLearning Consortium that I mentioned earlier. This has been a very complex and arduous process as we've begun from the scratch to try to build a timetable, find the staff who can teach those. Uh, one of the reasons Keith is teaching um, for uh, courses at this point is we have not been able to find a senior math teacher. And he happens, unfortunately for him, to have those qualifications. Uh, but congratulations to our staff that we have been able to. We also have moved our library teachers who had library sections in our schools because our libraries are shut down for the, currently. We've moved four of those teachers over to the remote learning school. And of course, I did mention that we have system staff who are also teaching. We are looking, uh, we are beginning our plans for future quadmasters. Uh, we're hoping that we can make a process that's a little bit smoother going forward. And um, so we'll be getting some more information about that. So um, that's lots of information I've given to you. I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add, um, uh, Superintendent Callahan, but I'd be glad to, or we would be glad to field any questions that you have. So any questions? That was a lot of information. It is. Yeah. Any questions or comments? Go ahead, Trustee Thompson. 
Do any of our online learners not have a teacher assigned to them at this point? There are those six students that were, were struggling to kind of get placed in courses, and you know, as of today, there were six left at secondary level. Um, as I mentioned with our elementaries, they're all attached to a class at this point. Um, those may change as we add, you know, what teacher there is, uh, who their teacher is may change uh, tomorrow as we add new staff uh, so that we're trying to reduce those class numbers. But yes, all of the students are assigned to a teacher at this point. Any other questions or comments? I don't see any, but I just want to say, oh, oh go ahead. Um, for our young learners, the gap between their opportunities to make a shift into in-class learning is quite long, in fact, longer than our secondary students. Mm -hmm. Is there any opportunity to put in a second transition point for those students? I mean, they're just beginning the process. They won't even know if it suits their learning style. And the complication, as I mentioned, is that we do need to meet the ministry requirements in terms of class size, and we need to, that's, I think, by the end of, um, of September, that that needs to be in. Is it September 30th, Rob, I think? Is, it's around that date anyways, and we have to submit our numbers, and we have to be on target at that point. Um, that we don't have a process in our collective agreement um, where we can do a shift. Um, we are having to talk to our unions at this point even about doing uh, some possible reorganization, you know, when we get to the beginning of term two. Um, I think that we, we do need to recognize that, you know, if we get to a situation where we, we have an outbreak, and we have, and we've seen that across the province where, you know, there have been classes maybe that have had to um, shut down. We are certainly talking to teachers and, you know, about preparing for that possibility so that if students have to transition to home learning, that they, they are prepared for that and able to do that, um, transition to that quickly and so that we're not losing a lot of time. So there is that piece, though, if we, we do get to that point. But we, we don't have another window at this point um, to, um, to, to open it up for students to, to move back into, or to move to transition across the panels. Uh, go ahead, Trustee Lutz. Thank you. Thank you. I real, realize you've all been working so hard to put all this in place. You might not have answers, but this might be something for later I know in some other school boards there were clear trends of where students were coming from or types of students who had chosen the online learning versus in class and I was just wondering if there were any high level trends in our school board or if that's not apparent yet or um, the like. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just, I'll go on my tiptoes. Um, yes, younger learners initially, um, just because parents, thank you, parents were um, not sure in the very beginning just what it was going to look like for our young learners as they came in. So we did see a trend there initially, just looking at that. We also have some students with special needs um, and some with intense special needs that medic they're medically fragile. And so we did see some of those students that just parents weren't comfortable coming back to school, which makes sense. So really that was the, that's the trend we've seen so far. Um, our numbers have shifted and gained. We've gained and gained and gained. So we don't really have good data yet other than our young learners and our students with special needs, but that is something we could bring to another report. Any further questions or comments for this section? I, it's not a question, but a comment, and it's just because of the count dates. And I, I would suggest strongly that this is just not something that affects the Blue Water Board, but every board across the province. Um, and I'm just wondering, because um, many of you will know that every Monday I get to be on a teleconference with the Minister of Education. And it might be a good question, you know, in terms of maybe, you know, this is a parent, uh, is there any, you know, to, to maybe build in some flexi flexibility and of course, they would have to focus on the, in the best interest of students. But do you think that might be helpful? Because I know from, I, I heard from 
some parents who were perturbed by this and um, that, you know, they just didn't feel they had long enough, you know, when they chose remote, um, but they didn't feel it was a long enough time, you know, like it was like a week or something for them um, to make that decision and that their next date that they could, you know, transition their, 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 their child back into the classroom was, I, I don't have the date, but it's a long time away and they were really counting on that it would be November. So I'm just asking from, I, at this point from senior administration, if that would be maybe a good question and I can work with our director on putting that one together. I, I believe, Chair Johnstone, that is uh, an excellent question to ask. I think there's an additional piece to that. Um, also in my conversation with Area 1 administrators today, um, there was a great deal of discussion about new registrations that are coming into Blue Water District School Board. Um, so principals are being called and told by um, parents that are bringing their children in um, that they're coming on such and such a date or such and such a date. And this is going to roll, according to them, right through the fall. And they will not count in our enrollment in terms of our uh, revenue. Um, so that so we will be having more children come, um, but they will not add to our coffers. And the, I think so along with the transition piece, um, an extension in the timelines for the enrollment submissions might be an appropriate question to ask or some way to mitigate um, the people that counted in another board on the count date but aren't going to count here later in terms of our, our revenue. Thank you. I, I, I saw that um, the director was busily writing, so we'll, we'll be quite ready for Monday. Go ahead, Trustee Thompson. The other piece that, uh, to, f to follow with your question, I noticed when I was doing some research online that different school boards are using different dates in terms of when their students can come back into a, their elementary students, they seem to be around um, uh, report card um, times. That They're using that as a break and a transition. I'm wondering where the continuity is in terms of their count dates and the numbers and the ministry um, and the, just how that's working across all of the boards in the province. And I, I'm not sure that I can speak to that, actually, with any great depth of knowledge. I, I, the count dates are the same for all of us, but the impact on, it may be a collective agreement issue and discussions with their, their teacher federations, I'm not sure. I don't know if my colleagues have anything further to add. I was going Sorry. to add to that as yeah. well. I was going to say, I think that there are different local collective agreements which are impacting and uh, as well the access to occasional teachers. Some of the bigger boards have greater access, although you did share the issue that they're having in TDSB. That, that was our biggest challenge. We couldn't find the occasional teachers, so we needed to right size both the remote learning school and our face-to-face -face school. Uh, and we don't have the flexibility to go back and forth. We needed solid numbers and we needed them early to be able to prepare for the reorganization that needs to occur. So my, my question is, if just say in our whole board, we have a certain amount of students that are say in secondary and elementary, I'm, I'm just gonna s simplify that. And we, we have this count date, right? That are, are we not receiving, this has to do with the fun, the, my favorite, the funding formula, that would we not be receiving that money no matter where they were? If they were in a, enrolled in a secondary class in a, in a physical school as opposed to the remote school, they're still gonna count. So I guess I, I, I'm trying to figure out where we need, you know, because we want them to count. So I heard you say, uh, Superintendent Lemming, that we were having um, students outside of our board coming to enroll. Is that Correct. what I, I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. So that happens anyhow. If we didn't have a pandemic, that all also happens. Um, but what I think I'm hearing is that there seems to be a lot more people that are, are coming into our, our board. Is that what I, I think I, I heard you say? That's all. 
that is my understanding and discussion with the Area 1 principals, and I can give the example of um, Dundalk, where there is new housing and families are moving in and adding to um, the numbers in, in that area. But I'm also, I also heard it for an Owen Sound school today as well, where they, the principal is getting calls, families are moving into the area, it's, they want to come north because they feel it's safer, they're bringing their children with them, they may not be able to expedite that to meet any count dates for us, so they'll be coming into school over the next few months, but they will not add to our revenue. Thank you. So I, I think that we have something to work on. Go ahead. Just as I see this report is coming to an end, I have to say Actually, I could not. Actually, not quite. Oh, you have some more? All right. <laughs> That's Sorry. okay. I'll, I will save my comments then. I thought we were done. I, I, I apologize, Director Wilder. I, I wanted to share one more thing with the trustees, if I may. Um, so I suspect that you've been hearing a lot of information about ill students and staff in schools and the impact that that's having in the buildings themselves and also on the assessment centers within Gray and Bruce counties. And it's, I just would like to walk you through that a little bit because this has been a challenge not only for Gray and Bruce Public Health and the assessment centers, but also for the schools. Uh, when we started this process, um, if a student was ill, their siblings uh, were also to remain at home and if their parents were staff members of Blue Water District School Board, they also were to remain at home. And they were all to remain at home until such time as they had a, a negative COVID test for the symptomatic child. Um, they had documentation from a, a registered healthcare professional to say that it was a chronic condition, for example, migraines or allergies or asthma, or um, they self-isolated for 14 days. So you would have heard and seen the lines at the assessment centers, the media reports about not being able to get appointments because they were booked so far out, the, the lag time in getting the assessment results. So a decision was made. Um, Public Health and the Medical Officer of Health had this discussion. Um, I think with the physicians in the area and, and other colleagues and also with the school board about that. Um, and at the same time, um, the ministry came out with a provincial online screening tool. And so at that point in time, we pivoted to um, the ill child would uh, remain at home. Um, the siblings and the parents could be at school or at work. Uh, and the, um, the child that's at home had to remain at home for 14 days in self-isolation or um, have a negative COVID test result or with the support of their registered healthcare professional um, clearly articulate for the principal of the school that this was a chronic medical condition. Um, so, and they, and they have to remain at home as well until it's 20, they have gone for 24 hours without symptoms. So I do see that there has come into um, some of us this evening, a, a media release um, from the Medical Officer of Health indicating that they um, believe that this conservative approach is necessary and that if a child is ill, they need to stay at home until such time they've met one of those three criteria and they are 24 hours symptom free. I know there's been a significant amount of pressure on the schools and on some trustees and on the Grey Bruce Health Unit about this, um, but uh, we firmly believe that, that what they're doing is clearly designed to ensure that the numbers of COVID cases in Bruce and Grey counties remain low and that all of us remain um, safe and healthy and well. Um, so we appreciate um, that rigorous approach to our health. And that was the last thing I wanted to share, thank you. Thank you, and I see Trustee Luce's hands up. Thank you so much for touching on that, because I wanted to ask about that earlier, and the information from Dr. Era has been quite good, and I also know having my daughter was at a very large urban daycare center when she was little. So I'm one of the few people in the area well versed with all the public health regulations around things because people might not be aware, but 
outbreak protocols have been around for a long time in public health and in a large daycare center, you deal with a lot of outbreaks. So um, as I know in our household, as soon as we were reminded of that, all this stuff became a lot more familiar. But one of the things I just wanted to ask, suggest, put out there that I know there is a lot of misinformation floating around and a lot of very frustrated and upset parents who don't necessarily have a good handle on the whys behind the different changes in the protocols that I don't know if we could have a communication piece that's a little less verbose than Dr. Era's very long letters. I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of infographics and other things, and I don't know if it's possible. I know everyone's already putting in a lot of work and a lot of hours, and these are things that look simple but are very complicated to create. That's something I know, but I know there's a lot of confusion, especially around the change in asymptomatic si siblings. Um, and I know, um, so, so just things like that, if we can get some really good simplified, and this is going to sound awful, but social media shareable <laughs> I I information to, to get out there that might be really good on that component. But thank you so much for all your hard work with public health. It really is keeping our schools safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And through the chair, uh, there are actually three flow charts um, that are um, uh, much more um, simplistic and they are currently back at public health being revised to reflect um, the current process and that we will be able to post those um, as soon as they're available to us. And I, and I have to say that our communications officer, Jamie Pettit, has been absolutely amazing in getting things up as quickly as we can. <laughs> One does not hide behind one's mask um, <laughs> to, to get things up as, as quickly as we try to churn them out for him. So um, Jamie's very responsive and we appreciate that. Any further questions or comments? Oh, yes. The director, go right ahead. Thank you, Chair Johnstone. I just wanted to say that honestly, I could not be more proud and thankful of this senior team and the work that they've done throughout the whole summer and continued now to this point in time. It has been phenomenal and I could not be more fortunate to work with these amazing people. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart, honestly, it's just, phenomenal. That also extends to our administrators who have worked so hard and the people in this building to keep the system up and running. And I know it's just been a phenomenal year. I, in all my years in education, I just, I can't, well, of course, none of us can fathom that this would have ever been the case or that this is where we would be. It's, we are constantly changing all the time. Um, I know I will use the word pivoting, but it's so true. It's just uh, the work that's being done and the support of the trustees is so appreciated uh, because we couldn't do it without you. And we do appreciate your questions. We appreciate the work that you've been doing. We know that you probably received more calls and emails uh, this last little bit of time than ever in your time with us. And uh, thank you for responding as you have been and then you know, letting me know so that we can help you in a response or that we can be the ones to respond back to the public because often we're the ones that have the specific necessary information. Um, it's just, I'm, I'm leaving here late at nights, but I'm not, I'm leaving with people are still here. Like I'm seeing people in learning services. Uh, you mentioned the likes uh, teaching. I talked to one of our system teachers and she's saying, oh, I'll be teaching parenting. She's never taught parenting before. And I said, well, you're very lucky you do have children. <laughs> so I said, remember it's red pajamas or blue pajamas. Uh, <laughs> there's the choice, but. Anyway, I just, from the bottom of my heart, I just could not be more proud and thankful. So I just wanted to uh, end with that note. Thank you through the chair. And I want to thank the trustees too for listening. We've taken up a lot of your time this evening. Well, no, it, it's really, I think it's really good for us because I think that it, it's quite true that trustees get various kinds of questions put to us. And sometimes we don't know. I mean, there's so often that I have just kind of <laughs> sent to uh, you know, I forward this and that. I mean, I, I, I know I send stuff to uh, our 
business asshole here, you know, because I go, oh, that's not mine. And I forward it to him because there's, there's lots of, and I know we're all getting some emails all around, you know, where they want us, you know, HVACs and I haven't got a clue and it's not my area anyhow. So um, we, we do that, but then we have parents and, uh, and um, some, and, and I realize that some parents, they just need to, you know, say stuff. Yeah, they need to vent, you know, that they're, you know, like, I, you know, the, so there's a, you know, kind of a, I'm sorry, this is the way it is, or we have to pivot, and they're looking for things that are very stable, this is the way it's going to be, and it's very, you know, it's very difficult, and, you know, and then it's kind of like you're, you're, you're lying, or, you know, and, and it's just about kind of sometimes bringing people back, back down, and to, to realize that, they, you know, our families have lots of various stresses going on that don't have anything to do with school and that, you know, and school is just an, another additional stress and it's about recognizing that. Um, so I, I just want to thank everybody. And I, I saw Jane have her hand up. Poor Director Wilder said such lovely things. And I, I, I want to also echo, I appreciate all the work. I just, um, I think it's, it's very, uh, challenging times for our families who tune into the media and hear very simplistic, oh, you can choose A or B, or you could go back into the classroom when that suits you, or uh, if the classes are too large, your boards have enough money to make them smaller. And those are very simplistic statements for very, very, very complicated uh, challenges and I, uh, we have the privilege to watch and see the the complications and how that work to a point and I appreciate it's only to a point to see all of the struggles that go with that. Most people don't see that; they see the end result. And I think our communication back out to them to explain the challenges that we have is very very important because I think many people would. Um, if they underst understood the challenge better, uh, will appreciate the, the glitches that they're seeing on their end. So I do thank you very much for the work. Thank you. There's no more questions. I'm going to put the motion back on the floor that the Blue Water District School Board received the return to school update report for information. It was moved by Trustee Thompson, uh, seconded by Trustee McComb. All in favor? and opposed, and of course that's carried. So thank you. Okay. So now we're under um, D and uh, communications, and normally there's a folder in front of me, but I didn't get any communication by folder, so nope. Um, and then it's D2, so that is communication and announcements, so that's related to student trustees or trustees or staff or Ministry of Education and OFSPA. So that's the Ontario Public School Board Association. So um, we, so we have the Ontario Public School Board Association, which is a, a board provincial organization um, myself, I sit on this provincial organization representing Blue Water, um, and the vice chair is actually my alternate, so that if I, for, ever, for some reason, cannot actually attend, then she will go in um, my place. And there's representatives for the public school, English public school. So there's about, I, I can't even remember, 42, 44. And um, so it's, it's both that idea about board and, and director. So then over top of that, I'm just, you know, is the Canadian School Board Association. So that is the national organization that, you know, basically um, has a, what I call a, a much bigger look. And, uh, you know, and so all the provincial organizations like OPSPA um, have, you know, have a representative on that organization. So that's just to understand, you know, kind of the, I guess, a, a, a visual, a graph of the organization. Anyway, what I'm really trying to get to is that they are, the Canadian School Board Association is presenting an Indigenous trustee panel, and of course it will be online um, October 8th at 1 p.m. 
and that you may actually attend that, on, you know, say online. And so I think that um, it, it's, um, here it is, we're ready now, let's talk. Reflections from Indigenous trustees. So it's gonna be a trustee panel, an online trustee panel hosted by the Canadian School Boards. And it, it talks a little bit about who the panelists are and participants will be able to pose questions to panelists during the session. And it actually gives, um, send, sent the link, it's gonna be a Zoom meeting. And um, so um, uh, our director thought it would be something that we all might really be interested in because of course on our board, um, we um, work together with and serve um, two different two different reserves and also we have also um, it's, uh, indigenous um, students and families who are off reserve and so they're going to be uh, addressing that. And anyway, I was just looking to see who was from um, Ontario and I recognize Peter Garrow. So I know Peter Garrow, he does stuff for uh, OPSPA so um, anyway, I think that is, if you can and you're available, it would be a, a, a really good educational opportunity. Go ahead, trust. Yeah, yes. So they're going to send that to to you um, electronically. And student trustees and senators, if you're interested, we can send you that link too. Like you know, so. You know, you, maybe you're not in class or maybe you're not doing remote learning or, you know, whatever you're doing, if that's of interest, then absolutely you're welcome to. And this coming weekend, um, if you're interested, it's the uh, annual general meeting of the Ontario Public School Board Association that was delayed later. So go ahead, Trustee Morgan. Um. Chair Johnstone, I understand that there are um, elections at that uh, meeting and you will be voting on our behalf, on the board's behalf. May we submit to you people that, that we think would be good chairs? Sure you could, I'm not sure, that it's, we're not picking chairs necessarily. So there's some different elections, and um, so there's a contested um, election for the president, and there's contested for the first and you know second um, vice president, and also for a region. Um, there's some different you know contestations, and, and absolutely, oftentimes what happens is I know most you know just because I'm a part of OSPA, I know these people better than just say trustees, but if you want to, you know, think you, you thought they're great, then absolutely I will take that into consideration. Um, having gone to several OPSPA uh, conferences and meetings, um, I feel that I, the, the people that are running for the president or whatever, I know each and every one of those people, and um, I, I would like to just put my thoughts forward on those. So I will email you that information. And if anybody else has any thoughts, I, I'm, you know, gladly, you know, have, you know, con consideration. It's been very, very odd because we're normally, we would get, you know, we've had more, I guess, physical togetherness and even to going to an HAM, you get more sense, but it, it feels much more, I'm gonna say, like a vacuum. <laughs> That's a good way to put it, is a vacuum. Okay, um, and then we're gonna do the trustee calendar of events, and I know that Trustee Atkinson, I did? Okay. Oh, okay. So is there any, um, you, you looking at the calendar, if there's events that you think should be in there, please let us know. 
And finally, that the Blue Water District School Board adjourn at 9.03 p.m. Can I have a mover? Thank you, Trustee Atkinson, second. Trustee McComb, all in favor and opposed. Carried, thank you very much.